Good morning to you. I wonder, uh, have you ever started doing the right thing? You know it's the right thing to do, but then things go wrong, and you, but you're doing the right thing. And, um, you know, for us as believers, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, important that when uh, God has spoken to us through his word and through the church, that we, 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 we do what is right and, and we leave the results in God's hands. We've got our faith that the Holy Spirit who has communicated to us knows what he's doing and he doesn't just inspire the church, he goes ahead of the church and he leads us. How do I know that? Because I watched Jesus leading his disciples and giving them orders and, and commands and telling them what to do or what not to do or asking them questions as he disciples them. He finds out where they're at on the journey of faith. And, uh, you know, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and so Jesus leads his disciples. So the Holy Spirit, this is the time of the Holy Spirit. And, um, you know, as we live in this time where the Holy Spirit fills each individual believer um, with, this, with, with himself, with the very presence of God, and it's the same Holy Spirit that Jesus had to lead his life and uh, to, to have wisdom from heaven and things like that. So even when you do the right thing, I want to say, I want to encourage people today, when you're doing the right thing, things can go wrong. And things can go wrong in a bad way, in a big way, I mean, you know, it's big and bad. And I want to encourage people, particularly if you're church planting, because... You know, people don't know how to identify with us. They're like, well, are you Church of England? Are you a Roman Catholic? Or are you a Baptist or a Pentecostal? Or what are you? And, um, and they can't always uh, put you in a box. And, and that's good, but it's not good sometimes because people need to trust us. And we work so hard and uh, uh, being obedient to the command God has given us to, to plant a church and... Um, then it would be so easy just to join another church. And I want to encourage you. I mean, if you've just started a church, you think it's a good idea. Why don't you just join the nearest church that's really effective, that's Bible-based and, and filled with the Holy Spirit and actually enjoy life and not endure life. Just join that one. But if God has spoken to you and commanded you to plant a church, it's to you I'm speaking to. And these principles today are relevant to business owners as well. Because you're different from everybody else. Everybody else goes for employment. You are now trying to get a business off the ground. That's a whole different ball game. And you look stupid sometimes. You look silly. You look like you don't know what you're doing. Anyway, <laughs> can you see the parallels? It's the same with church planting. It's the same with business. And um, it would be much easier to settle for something less. But God has put something in your heart. And I want to encourage you today to remain faithful to what God has said to you and uh, check it off because God, uh, once you've fulfilled what you're supposed to do, God then moves you on. God speaks again. We've got to be open to the Holy Spirit speaking to us again and giving us direction and redirection. So I want to look today at, um, at the disciples who represent the church. These 12 men really represent the church when we look at them. And uh, I want to look at the story of Jesus walking on the water. That's the emphasis. And there's, there, are, there are three uh, gospel writers, Matthew, Mark and John, that write about this. And they all had something different. But here I want to read from uh, uh, John chapter 6, verse 16. And it says this. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. Jesus had just fed the 5,000, 5,000 men plus women, plus children, 20, maybe 30,000 people were there. And Jesus fed them with five loaves and two fish. It was an absolute miracle. And um, after the people saw the, this miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, surely this is the prophet who came, who is to come into the world because Moses had promised that God is going to send somebody like himself. And he's the one that's going to lead um, God's people and it says in, in uh, John chapter 5 verse 15 John chapter, chapter 6 verse 15 Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force withdrew again 
to a mountain by himself. Why was Jesus reluctant to become their king? Because Jesus is the king of the Jews. Jesus is the king of the world. So why was he reluctant? And he was reluctant for one simple reason. As much as they wanted him to be their sovereign, they refused to become his subject. Watch out Prince Charles. <laughs> king Charles, sorry. Watch out King's, King Charles. Because, you know, as much as people will, yeah, applaud and, 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 and things and say, it's good to have a monarch, it's good. And it's like, yeah, but would you be the subject? And Jesus knew what was in the heart of men and he didn't trust himself to men. And, um, you, you know, he knew that they wanted him to be their sovereign but they were not ready yet to become his subject. And that's a challenge for Christians today. I want to challenge you and say, you keep praying for God, you know, heal, heal this or provide for that. And you love it when he's your sovereign. But when he, he, um, he calls you to be his subject, you're like, yeah, but I'm busy. Yeah, but I'm, I'm just getting on with things. Yeah, but, and, and Jesus always was looking for subjects. And uh, today I want to challenge you. Let's become subjects of the king, better subjects. Let's humble ourselves. Jesus said this, if you would come after me, if you would follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And uh, it's, this is not a picnic. It's not a game. This is not like a little club that we belong to and then real life happens somewhere else. This is the real thing. It makes me laugh sometimes. You know, you, 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 you may go to a Bible study and, and uh, something's happened in the street or, or, or in the country and it's tragic. And one says, oh, we're not going to have a Bible study tonight. No, we're going to talk about what's gone on. And, and it's just like, come on, let's get our priorities right. And we've totally missed it. What a tragedy needs. When something's happened in, in, in the nation or in the street or in the community, what it needs first and foremost is, what does God say about this? Where is strength and comfort from God's word for this? When we step out to uh, encourage or help other people, have we been to God first and got his word? So that we take something, not just psycho babble and stuff like that, but something of substance from heaven to touch men and women's hearts. So let's, let's become subjects of the king. I want to identify with people who don't know Jesus. I do. But do you know something? If, I, if all I ever do is identify with them and never bring God's word, then there's something wrong. I, there's, there's something wrong in me. There's something wrong about how I view what Christianity is all about. One guy said, you know, sharing your faith is the most loving thing you can do to any human being. Another guy said this. He says, you're sharing your faith. It's like one hungry beggar telling an hungry, another hungry beggar how to find food. It's like, it's so kind. So come on, I'm just trying to bring us back. Bring us back into to, to line with God's word. And Jesus refused to be their king under their conditions. He is their king, but not under their conditions. Um, so he will be their king. Well, he might not have been some of their king, but he will be somebody's king. Those who have got a place in the heart for him that come to him on his terms, not their terms. And I see this. I see so many people give their life to Christ. And as they're following him, they read something in the Bible and they'll say, I don't agree with that. As, as though they, they're the genius. No, we, we don't sit above God's word. You, you're not judging it. Oh, I don't know. I believe. I believe. Strongly believe. Don't believe. No, no. God's word is there as a foundation for our life. And it's set, it's immovable. This truth is relevant in all generations and to all peoples, not just the West, not just the Christian peoples, but right through the whole world. Anyway, we're talking about walking on the water. I haven't even got there yet. So John chapter six, verse 16, when evening came, this is after Jesus has fed the 5,000 and refused to become their king on their terms. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. Now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. 
a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. When they were, uh, then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. And that's incredible. In fact, the crowd the next day, they went looking for Jesus and they realized that one boat had been taken and yet Jesus was on the, the shore when the boat had left. And they're like, who is this Jesus? And I want to read from, um, from Mark's, uh, Mark's account. We've got three different accounts of the same thing and it really shows that it's like you can trust it because that's what happens whenever uh, there's an event that, that, that takes place. You'll always get different opinions, but the core of it is he, 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 everybody agrees on the core details. <coughs> Pardon me. So Mark chapter 6, uh, verse 45, it says, Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. I need to get all of that. He, he made them get into the boat. He's commanding them. You, you, this is what I want you to do. And then he went and he dismissed the crowd. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake and he was alone on land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. About the fourth watch of the night, that's like between three o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the morning. About the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out because they all saw him and were terrified. Immediately, he spoke to them and said, take courage. It is I, don't be afraid. Then he climbed into the boat with them and the wind died down. They were completely amazed for they had not understood about the loaves and their hearts were hardened, meaning they hadn't understood what Jesus had done prior when he fed the 5,000. They hadn't understood what the 20,000 or whatever. They hadn't understood what was going on and that is, Jesus is doing what God did in the wilderness to the people when there wasn't any food. God gave them manna from heaven. And uh, John text, texts this up um, later in his gospel. And you've got the, a, a huge, like we call it a discourse, but a huge talk and a huge narrative that's going on. Uh, um, a discussion with people, Jesus and, and, and religious leaders and, and, and the crowds and talking about this. And you know, the, 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 the same God who, who parted the seas uh, so that Israel could get out of Egypt, the same God who then fed his people in the desert with manna for 40 years. Um, it, it, Jesus is, is with Jesus or is Jesus or is in Jesus. And that's what Jesus is trying to get them to see. He's like saying, you know, you, you crowd, you're following me today because I fed you yesterday. But you're not getting the meaning of it. And his disciples didn't get the meaning. And they were like, they said, yeah, but, uh, but you know, they were fed from heaven. He says, no, they were fed from my father in heaven. And, he, and, and Jesus is displaying the same attributes as God. And he's like, Do you, are you making the connection? It comes to water. And, and Jesus is the creator. He created water. And, and it was Jesus who parted the Red Seas in, in his previous life, his previous state as part of the Trinity. He was there. And thousands of years later, Jesus walks on the water. He's the king. He, he, he knows how, how to do these kind of things. It's way beyond us. But Jesus is the king of the water. He's the creator of the water. It, it does what it's told. When he says, I want that sea to open up, the sea opens up. And when he says, I'm going to walk on water, he walks on water. It has to do as it's told. And we don't get this in our scientific age. Science is brilliant, but it's limited. And uh, some 
some uh, scholars, they struggled with Jesus walking on the water. They said he wasn't actually walking on the water. He was walking beside the, 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 the lake and he, he, was, he, he was like sort of encouraging uh, uh, the, the guys from the lake. He wasn't actually walking on the water. The problem with that is, is that John says he's about three to three and a half miles. The boat is about three to three and a half miles away from the shore. So it's like, I don't think so. And John records that it was dark. The other writers don't record that, but John does. And they're out there because, you know, uh, as, as, as they're straining on the oars, when they're, they're straining against the wind, yeah, it was grim. And, you, you know, not only were they in a storm, but it was dark. So I want to apply some of this to us because it, it's vital that we get it when it comes to planting new churches are starting new things that we believe that God has told us to do. Even a marriage. You know, a marriage made in heaven needs to be worked at on earth. If you want a storm, get married. Because <laughs> it's going to happen. Why? Because two strong-willed people come together. And strong-willed people do not go with the flaw. They have to learn how to flaw. And so I want to encourage you today... If you're doing what you believe God has told you to do, you're honouring his word and you're trying to do it right and everything is going wrong. And I want to stay, say, stay at your post. Keep going because Jesus is about to catch you up. And I, I want to encourage you with that. How can I say them things? It's because I've read that story. And these stories are not just stories that you read to your children as they're going to bed at night. These stories are history. They happened. And the same God that did that for the disciples can come alongside you. And he can come and make sense of what you're going through. So when life just happens, as a believer, it doesn't just happen. God allows certain things into our lives so that we call out to him, that we, 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 we connect with him because he wants to shape us. He wants to shape our attitude. It's the biggest thing. He wants us to become like his son, Jesus. So he has to knock some rough edges off. And I can remember, you know, getting angry at God and telling him everything what I thought about him. And now I look back and I think, I'd never do that now. Some things have changed, but then I was raw and I was like honest and upfront. And this is what I think and I don't care. Kill me if you want. God must have heard that a million times. And he doesn't want to kill us. He's come to give us life. But he wants to show us how to live life and handle pressure. So, when we're going through life, um, bad things happen. Even when you're in the centre of God's will. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, had just been murdered. Why? For preaching about Jesus. And for saying that we need to repent of our sins. Because one is coming who is going to judge the world. And he pointed to Jesus Christ and he said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And um, he was pointing to the future event where Jesus would die on the cross for the sins of the whole world. And uh, but also he preached about Jesus's return. He said, you know, the, uh, when he comes, he will he will baptize the, 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 the world with fire. And he says the axe is at the root of the trees. He will chop the proud down. And John was a, a formidable preacher. And even the king listened to him and was terrified, intrigued, but worried. And, um, you know, Jesus had just heard that his cousin had been murdered uh, for preaching about the kingdom of heaven. And uh, Jesus is in grief and he takes his disciples to one side. But then he's doing some teaching. People gather around and Jesus just, you know, shares God's word, brings healing and deliverance. And then he feeds the crowd and um, eventually Jesus, uh, uh, you know, after doing this for days, he's just saying, it's time. Guys, you get into the boat. We can't, we can't get away from the crowds. That's the only escape route. Get into the boat and then leave the crowds to me. Jesus does all the mopping up. What a leader. He goes back and he dismisses the crowd. Can you imagine dismissing people and saying, enough's enough, guys, we're finished. The gig's over and you need to go home. Imagine saying that. I mean, somebody's going to have to say that this weekend um, uh, or early mo uh, Monday morning for all the crowds that are queuing up to just to pay their respects to the Queen who's laid in state 
in Westminster. Um, somebody somewhere is going to have to say there's no more can come through. And it's a tough call because we feel for people. Uh, but that somebody has to do it. Jesus did it. Jesus did the mopping up. <coughs> Servant leadership. Jesus then goes and he dismissed the crowd. And I want to say that if you're going to go anywhere, you've got to dismiss the crowd. If you're going to go, if you're going to do anything in life, you can't play to the crowd. You can't play to the galleries. The crowd had already wanted Jesus to be the king and he refuses. For most of us, we'll be going, yeah, we've got a mega church overnight, 30,000 years. But not Jesus. Because he knew he'd have a crowd, but not a church. And there's a big difference. And Jesus wants to build his church. And I want to encourage you, use small church plants. Come on, don't have a small mentality. Keep that big mentality, but keep going where you are. And the crowds, you know, you may have had to uh, move away from people and you've lost the crowds, but you're doing the right thing. You're keeping going. And, uh, and I want to say that as Jesus dismissed the crowds, he was free then to go and pray. And as Jesus dismissed the crowds, his disciples were released to go into their future. It's important that we're not led by the crowds there was a time when I was younger I just wanted to I couldn't even go on holiday without performing I was always making people laugh or, or, or uh, trying trying to to uh, get liked by every you know bring a fun atmosphere it wasn't so much getting liked by everybody but it was getting a fun atmosphere going in the hotel or wherever we were and so many people I can look back now were probably looking at me and saying this is my holiday I don't want your holiday I want my holiday <laughs> And I've learnt all the life and I've, I've calmed down a little bit with that. Only a little bit. But I want to say that, you know, you haven't got 5,000 men plus women and children uh, in, in, uh, in your world. But maybe you've got the crowds in your mind. And there's too many people trying to influence you. Some of them people are dead. They've been dead a long time. And yet this, this, what they thought of you is still registered up there. Dismiss the crowd. Dismiss the crowd. Stop living for your parents. Stop living for what other people expect of you. Stop. Dismiss the crowd. Stop trying to become the person that everybody else wants you to be and become the real you. Come on, it takes courage. But when you dismiss the crowds, you're free. You're free to go and pray and get, get, get revelation for your future. You're free to get in a boat and move on. And move on. It just, that boat's a real metaphor for church. He says the wind and the waves came at it. Things, secularism comes at the church. You know, the wind of secularism and unbelief. You know, science has become like, like the, the, the religion of the day. But it's not scientific. We, we don't trust it. And you're like, goodness me, how many marriages are built on science? <laughs> just a thought. But, you know, everything comes against that boat. And the, the 12 in the boat, are confused. Why? Because Jesus isn't there. They can't just turn around and say, what do we do now, Jesus? They have to just keep going. And they keep going. They couldn't see Jesus. But in Mark's gospel, it says, Jesus saw them straining at the oars. And I want to say today, Jesus sees you straining to make a difference in this world. Jesus sees you, you yeah, that businesswoman, businessman, if you're trying to get a business off the ground, you're going to have to employ people. And then often employ people who are not grateful people. They just want their wage and go home and, and uh, they're going to vote Labour next time. <laughs> they're so angry and uptight about people. You just make money and we're just, we're just slaves. And uh, they have no idea, no concept about what you're going through. Trying to build a business and get a, make it profitable so that you can employ people. Yeah, but you're driving a Tesla. Well, so what? There's rewards for all the hard work that's put in. When you lot go on, the boss stays back and has to think, crunch figures and, and find work. You know what I'm talking about. It's the same with church planting. Everybody else just sails through. But when you're planting a church, you're not like other churches who seem to be so organized and so together. You're the ones like, what, what on earth were you doing in a boat on the lake? What kind of church are you? <laughs> Idiots. You're doing all sorts of daft stuff. But you, you, you're trying to be obedient to what, what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And so Jesus 
sees all that. He watched them straining at the oars. Pick that encouragement up today. God is watching you straining at the oars. Maybe you've got a young family and you, you know, you're going to work and you've two different socks on. <laughs> you can't find your jacket. So your jacket that you put on doesn't fit what else, whatever else you've got on, you're like oblivious because you've got kids running around your ankles, you've got demands and, uh, and you, you're trying to make it happen in life. I want to encourage you. Jesus is about to catch you up. Everything got rough. They'd been in the floor with Jesus. They'd seen, you know, they'd been part of the miracle of feeding the 5,000. They'd seen God manifest and multiply bread and fish in their hands as they were giving it out. It must have been amazing for them. Momentum was building nicely to the point where they wanted, they recognised this is a king. We want him to be our king. Jesus said, you want me to be your king because I filled your belly. Because I'm doing everything you want me to do. But I'm not that kind of king. I'm looking for the subjects who will follow me beyond understanding. They will follow me. They'll have an allegiance to me that's second to none. What about you today? Have you got that allegiance to Jesus? I want that allegiance. I want it more and more. I desire it. And when I'm not 100% for God, I feel it. I feel like, come on, Dave. There's nothing better. There's nothing fresher. There's nothing more invigorating than walking with Jesus Christ, being led by his Holy Spirit. The boat is a considerable distance away from the land and it's been rocked all over the shore. Is your boat being rocked today? Take courage. You're in good company. Everything was against it. And I want to say, during that night, three and a half miles out from the shore, there's no way, they know there's no way Jesus can come and help them. No way. He's on the shore. He's, he's never done that kind of miracle before, but they don't realise when he says, uh, uh, you know, take courage, it is I. He's using the word for God Almighty, I am. And it was, it was God Almighty that split the Red Sea. Jesus can do what he wants with water. If he wants to walk on it, that's what he's going to do. And so Jesus walks on the water and they didn't expect it at all. And, you know, I want to say, get ready for Jesus to turn up for you in ways that you never expected. He's not going to come walking alongside of you, but he'll be inspiring people who will open doors for you. He'll inspire people that will open communities open for you as a church so that you get into that community and you're able to share the gospel. I'm running out of time here, but I, I, there's so much more that I want to say. Maybe I'll, I'll throw it on to next week. But I want to say Jesus is about to turn up and be careful that you don't miss him. The disciples almost missed him. And um, you know, when they saw him, this is, this is so authentic, this story. Because when they saw him, they thought he was a ghost, yeah. But when they saw him, they were more scared of him than the storm. How amazing is that? They were terrified. And uh, Jesus had to calm them down. We're going to look at this next week. But I want to say to you, stay at your post. Keep going. Keep going with your church plan. Keep, keep reaching out into the communities. Love isn't a feeling. Love is, is serving people and uh, bringing them into faith. And that can take years. That can take time, but stick at it. And, uh, you know, I want to encourage you to enjoy the journey when you can. I mean, if you're in the boat in the middle of a lake and the storm there, you've just got to keep going. And that's what I want to speak to today. Keep going. Keep believing and keep believing for the breakthrough. Keep believing that Jesus is going to come and, and, and uh, move you from the middle. You've set off. You set off on your journey, you had an idea of what it was going to be and then the storm came or the storms have come and I want to encourage you that when he calms them storms, he's going to get you to the other side. In John's Gospel it says this, Jesus got in the boat and immediately they were at the other side. Jesus, who had control over the water, has control over time and space and gravity and the moment his kingliness got in that boat. It got the message from him. Get over there. And immediately the boat was there. A miracle that we miss in this story. It's so amazing. 
scientists are baffled. I've just lost all the scientists there. But you know, the word of God is true. These guys recorded what they saw and heard. And um, you know, like I said, there's different accounts, but you know, the core of it is, is you know, they all agree on. It's authentic and you can believe it. And more than that, you can live in the good of it. I've finished, I've said plenty. Every week we give people an opportunity to turn their lives around and to turn to face God and say, I want to follow you. And if that's you, I'm going to invite you to follow Jesus and follow his ways. And maybe you're a believer that's lost your way. And I say, get back on and come and follow Jesus again. That's repentance. So just bow your heads where you are and let's pray. Lord Jesus, I realize that I need you. I'm in a storm, but I need you to come into my life. I open the door of my heart to you and I ask that you will send your Holy Spirit to come and live in me and to make you real to me. And I pray that you'll give me the strength and courage to dismiss the crowds and to follow you, to focus on you and to be led by you. I receive your forgiveness today and I want to start my journey with you. And I ask that you'll lead me from now on in Jesus' name. Amen. If you said that prayer, get in touch with us. Thanks for listening. And we'll see you again next week.